Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 10th annual Wild Writers Festival. I'm Pamela Malloy, and I'm the creative, creative director of the festival. Um, this year, this is our 10th anniversary, and the festival is brought to you by the New Quarterly magazine, Wordsworth Book, and the Balsillie School of International Affairs. Before I begin, I would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to our festival donors and sponsors, including the Ontario Arts Council, the NAP Wealth Management Team at RBC Dominion Securities, and Audie Kitchener Waterloo. And now I'm going to introduce our presenter tonight, Paul Vermeer, and I'll ask him to, to jump on screen here. Paul Vermeer is the author of seven books of poetry, a professor of publishing at Sheridan College and the senior editor of Woolsack and Wynn Publishers. He holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of Guelph for which he received the Governor General's Gold Award. His most recent book is Shared Universe, New and Selected Poems, 1995 to 2020. When he's not making art out of words, he likes to make art out of paint and sometimes even out of sounds when he lives in Toronto. Welcome, Paul, and I'll turn it over to you, and you can tell us all about the world of self-publishing. Thank you, Pamela. I'd, I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to thank Wild Writers and all its sponsors uh, for making this possible. And I'm very happy to be here today to talk about uh, a topic that I find fascinating, uh, and that is self-publishing. And uh, I'm just going to get my screen sharing ready to go. And I can walk you all through my talk. So welcome to the audience uh, for self-publishing tonight. Um, uh, we have a lot of interesting things to talk about. And um, hopefully at the end of this, uh, this talk, um, those of you who are interested in in what self-publishing can do and what self-publishing maybe isn't so good at um, might be uh, better positioned to uh, make decisions about what kind of self-publishing activities might be right for you. And um, let's see here if this will work. Uh, before we begin, uh, a little... Um, Disclaimer, this is not a how to self publish workshop or a how to get published seminar. So I'm not really gonna be talking about those things. And instead I will discuss the historical and present day context of self publishing, its uses and usefulness, as well as its promises and inevitable pitfalls. Armed with the knowledge of self publishing from Gutenberg to Instagram, a rich history with revolution, community building, craft work, and scams, attendees, that is you, will be better able to decide for themselves if self-publishing is right for them and their writing project, or if pursuing traditional publishing might be more suitable. Who am I? Pamela gave you a bit of a uh, introduction. So uh, very quickly, I can tell you uh, about some of the activities that I'm involved in. Um, I am the author of seven poetry collections that are published for the book trade uh, in, by trade publishers. Um, it says seven there. These are the four I like. And um, so you can have a look at those. I've been working in publishing for over 20 years, and I've been the senior editor of Woolsack and Wynn Publishers for the last 10 years. Uh, and over that 20 years, I have edited um, about 100 books for the book trade. I'm also a professor of publishing at Sheridan College, where I have recently um, helped uh, create and develop a new literary magazine called the Ampersand Review of Writing and Publishing. And we've had our first uh, issue out uh, this past year, and we're looking forward to bringing out uh, a second issue in the new year. And on top of all these things, I'm also an active self-publisher. Um, and you can see here some of the things that uh, I have self-published. Uh, my most recent uh, handmade chat book is here, Further Communiques from the Imaginary World. Uh, I brought that out two years ago. I made it myself. Everything that went into it was handmade, DIY, do it yourself. Um, and it had uh, new poems in it that were going to appear in what is now my most recent 
trade publication, um, Shared Universe New and Selected Poems. And then the other things that you see here are kind of like comic pamphlets for an art project uh, that I work on called the Holy Order of the Sasquatch, which is this sort of fake religious knighthood uh, that people can join if they want to. Um, and these, uh, these, these uh, epistles uh, in pamphlet form are kind of our uh, uh, holy texts. And this is all, this is all a completely self-published uh, kind of project that I work on. It's, and it wouldn't be suitable, I think, for sort of the commercial trade uh, publishing. And, um, and I wouldn't necessarily want to do it in that format. So this is the kind of thing that to me and for my own purposes, is perfectly suited to self-publishing. And I'm not just going to be talking about my own projects during this talk. I want to go back to uh, the beginning of publishing overall and talk about how self-publishing has been, is, is not a new thing. It's always been there. And um, I will say that we're going to have a Q&A at the end of this talk. Uh, so if you, if you notice at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A uh, feature. And if you want to ask questions uh, for the end of our presentation, uh, you can put them in there. And uh, Pamela will, will be going through the questions and she'll pick some out for, for the end of our session today. And um, what do we know academically, scholastically, statistically about self-publishing? I'll say it's not much. Um, there was a study published in uh, 2012 called Self-Published Books, an Empirical Snapshot that uh, was written by uh, Jana Bradley, Bruce Fulton, and Marlene Helm. And this was really the first ambitious academic uh, sort of survey of the self-publishing industry. And it provides kind of a baseline. Uh, it provides kind of a baseline for uh, what we understand about the self-published in industry. And um, these are some of the numbers from that study. Uh, so Bowker estimates that roughly a million book titles were published in 2009. Uh, in the last 12 years, that number has only gone up, but the ratios that we see here have been more or less stable. So of that million books, and we can, we can let's, let's round out here, a, a, about a third of them, a little less than a third, are from mainstream publishers, and about two-thirds of those books then are from non-traditional publishers. And non-traditional publishers, uh, for the sake of this study, uh, incorporates reprint houses specializing in public domain works, presses catering to self-publishers, and micro-niche publishers. And those are three very different things, and we can sort of separate these out. Um, Reprint houses specializing in public domain works. These are those publishers that publish. They'll publish the a, an edition of um, a a book by Charles Dickens that's been in the public domain for a long time. Um, any one of you watching this, by the way, can publish a book by Charles Dickens if you want. If it's in the public domain, you can start a reprint house and you can publish these books. Uh, yourself. And a lot of people are doing this on the internet lately, which we can talk about later. Then there's presses catering to self-publishers. These are um, uh, what are often called vanity presses. Uh, uh, or, or, and there's a lot of new terminology for them. Uh, some people call it direct publishing uh, or just self-publishing platforms. And these are, these are companies that sell uh, sort of printing services to people who would like to publish a book for themselves. Then micro niche publishers are um, publishing books that are not for the book trade. And the book trade, uh, we, we can understand as a sort of traditional mainstream commercial uh, book publishers who uh, distribute their books through um, uh, distributors that cater to 
uh, wholesalers and retailers so that you can buy these books in a bookstore and uh, order them from online retailers and that kind of thing. That's what we mean by mainstream publishers or what I will refer to as trade publishers. And we call those trade publishers uh, because they participate in the book trade, which is the retail book trade where you buy books in a store, whether it's a brick and mortar store on the street or a retail store online. And um, where you probably have discovered many of your favorite writers, that kind of thing. So the non-traditional publishers are these reprint houses that just churn out uh, copies of public domain works, um, self, self pub platforms and micro niche publishers, which um, are not, which are book publishers that are not catering to the book trade. So these are books that you wouldn't find in bookstores that are not distributed by the usual channels, but maybe you find it on a, on a website somewhere. Um, they've got a, a specific kind of audience. Maybe it's just like a like a marketing company that prints books for people on the speaking circuit. Like a lot of people just go from like company to company and give like management coaching uh, kind of seminars and, and there's all, they always leave a book behind. Um, you know, everybody who went to the seminar gets a copy of this book. And uh, that's a kind of micro niche publisher, but it also micro niche publishing can also be like, uh, like a local church group that puts out like a Sirlox bound uh, cookbook uh, every year in the fall for for a stocking stuffer and it's their part of their bake sale fundraiser. That's also a micro niche publisher. Um, and, uh, and lots of other things constitute micro niche publishing. Uh, so from the time this study was conducted, most of the books published in the world are from non traditional publishers and a big chunk of that is from the self publishing uh, sector. Uh, that said, a vast majority of sales, that is practically all, come from the first category of books, which is trade publishing, which is because that's the segment of the industry that has infrastructure for distribution, marketing, publicity, retail, and getting books into the hands of readers. So those are the, those are the numbers from that study. And move on to the next slide. So micro niche publishers are small publishers who specialize in their own and others works, usually for very small audiences. This includes chat books, pamphlets, zines, and all manner of handmade literary ephemera, so long as it's not only the publisher's own work, because then that would just be a self publisher. Um, so to be a micro niche publisher, you can publish your own work, but you also publish some other people. Um, and this includes all these things and things like um, uh, copies of books that get uh, distributed through uh, like a management speaking circuit or church basement cookbooks, uh, things like that. Um, at Sheridan College, uh, where I teach, a couple of years ago, we celebrated our 50th anniversary. And uh, a couple of historians on our faculty uh, put together a book about the 50 years of Sheridan's history, and uh, we had that published, and not for the trade. Um, it's not the kind of book that uh, you would find in a bookstore, but it, is, it would only be of interest to Sheridan faculty, staff, and alumni, and uh, and those those are the people who ended up getting a copy. And it's the kind of thing you can give to a, a VIP who's sort of touring the campus, and they can find out all about our history. And that's another example of a micro niche publishing operation. Like no nobody would want to go to a, a bookstore in a mall and and buy a copy of the first fifty years of Sheridan College's history. It's not a commercial product. Uh, so this would fall under these non-traditional publishing model that also includes reprint houses and self-publishing platforms. That brings us to vanity presses. So the vanity press, as it's come to be known, and, and again, there's a sort of a stigma. Um, uh, in the 20th century, they were called 
subsidy publishers back in the 50s uh, and frequently vanity press presses produced books for authors willing to pay a substantial price for offset printing. Uh, books published uh, here are rarely entered the commercial book market since book distribution was tightly controlled by a few companies, still is, uh, in the mainstream publishing industry, and authors who paid for subsidy publishing generally paid for copies as well, and many ended up with piles of undistributed books. Um, and when it comes to paying for offset printing, or even POD, print on demand, um, where you get a carton up front, um, often, uh, unless uh, the self-publisher is sort of dedicated and skilled in this way, it can be very difficult to uh, distribute those books effectively. And it's cheaper today. Let's, let's be honest. Um, although today's self-publishing is sometimes likened to the vanity presses of yore, uh, the key differences uh, shape the current self-publishing phenomenon. Fee-based publication services using digital printing and book production and print on demand have drastically reduced the cost barriers for self-publishing, but there are still barriers for the self-published author when it comes to the book trade. And I think we need to kind of face these barriers up front and just get them out of the way. Um, and before we do that, um, uh, people often say, well, what about this author or that author? I heard this author self-published their book. I heard Walt Whitman self-published Leaves of Grass. I heard Beatrix Potter self-published Peter Cottontail. Nathaniel Hawthorne self-published uh, uh, his novels like uh, The Last of the Mohicans. And uh, this guy, Tom Peters, sold 3 million copies of his uh, uh, management philosophy. Um, and uh, it's interesting to bring those up. The modern publishing industry, as we know it today, with all of its sort of distribution channels and stores and, uh, and media, did not exist as it exists today. So it was common for people like Whitman and Hawthorne and Potter and others like that to, uh, to publish their own work. That was often how books got published in those, in those days, uh, but certainly things have changed. And uh, Tom Peters' book, In Search of Excellence, is often cited as a self-publishing success story, selling over 3 million copies. But Tom Peters' book was the product of a management consulting firm and not a book publisher, so it gets called self-published. Uh, but it is now published by HarperCollins. Um, so someone picked up the torch there and ran with it. But uh, this is the kind of book that got sort of uh, sold to people through like a management speaking circuit. Um, so everyone who signs up for the, the seminar gets a copy of the book and you call that 300 people show up, you call that 300 sales. And um, uh, but again, this would be considered, uh, until HarperCollins picked it up, this would have been considered non-traditional publishing. Whether or not, whether or not it's self-publishing, I mean, there's certainly like the money didn't all come out of uh, Tom Peter's pocket. So that's, that's an iffy example. Other exceptions to the rule, uh, because when we have these talks about self-publishing, Everyone wants to. Everyone wants to focus on the success stories, the big, the big success stories, um, and a book that's very near and dear to my heart, *The Elements of Style*, by William Strunk Jr. and now sold as uh, by being uh, William Strunk Jr. and E.B. White was originally self-published, which is misleading. It was it was self-created by William Strunk as a handout for his students in one of his composition classes. Um, and then it was prepared for the book trade by E.B. White. And that's when it became such a successful book. And, it, and today it is published by Pearson, which is of course a giant company in uh, the educational publishing industry. 50 Shades of Grey gets bought up. Oh, E.L. James uh, self-published this massive runaway bestseller. And again, that's misleading. Um, yes, she did. When she self-published it, it was a, a Twilight fan fiction. Um, it was uh, not ready for 
uh, the book trade. All the characters' names had to be changed because there would have been legal issues with Stephanie Meyer's uh, copyright. Um, and by the time it's the Fifty Shades of Grey that we know, uh, it, it's published by Bloom, which is a commercial publishing house, it sells 100 million copies. But certainly those 100 million copies didn't get sold uh, by E.L. James as a self-publisher. A Time to Kill, John Grisham's first book, often gets brought up as a self-publishing success story. And this one, I've got a question mark next to that. Um, a Time to Kill uh, came out, and whether it was self-published, uh, it was published by uh, a little-known publisher called Winwood, and whether that's a... Um, uh, like a vanity press uh, or a, a direct publisher. Uh, I'm, I'm not able to, uh, I haven't been able to find that information, um, but it was not a runaway hit. Uh, John Grisham didn't really have a big hit until his second novel, The Firm, which we've all heard of, was published by Doubleday in 1991. And then subsequent paperback editions of A Time to Kill came out and then it became a hit a after The Firm was a big hit. Um, and those paperback editions were published by Dell and Doubleday, and uh, those are the ones that sold and made A Time to Kill a best-selling book, but not until the firm uh, had had success uh, with Doubleday. And then there's The Joy of Cooking by Irma Rombauer. In the early 30s, yes, this was a self-published book. She paid to have uh, 3,000 copies made and she sold through her run and uh it was a local favorite and was picked up by a publishing company called bob's merrill uh that turned it into a, a commercial success and today uh the joy of cooking is still published by um scribner and of course millions of copies have been printed and sold and uh, but millions of copies were not printed and sold as a self-published book but 3,000 or, or fewer copies were sold as a self-published book. And then it became a commercial product. And I don't know, I, I, I keep seeing The Wealthy Barber by David Chilton as a, um, a book that was a success as a self-published title. And I, I'm not aware of any copies that were sold as a self-published copy. I, I became aware of this book and it was published by Stoddart, which is a company that no longer exists. Uh, largely thanks to uh, upheaval in the Canadian publishing industry around the time that uh, Chapters was uh, disrupting uh, common business practices of the day in the uh, early 2000s. Um, certainly Stoddart sold a ton of these. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how many were sold, if any, as a self-published book, but it's one that gets brought up a lot. But sort of all of these books did not really uh, achieve commercial success until they were published by a trade publisher. And um, so a lot of the exceptions to the rule uh, that we hear about um, actually are not. Um, and upon closer inspection, um, sort of reveal the effectiveness of the book trade. So what's the difference between self-publishing and trade publishing? In trade publishing, the author is paid in advance. Uh, publishing, uh, the publishing house provides uh, professional editorial services. The publisher provides marketing and publicity assistance. The publisher has access to wholesale, wholesale and retail distribution and eligibility for established literary prizes. In self-publishing, the author is not paid. Uh, costs come out of the author's pocket. No professional editorial services are provided. If you want those, you have to pay for those. No marketing or publicity assistance is provided. If you want that, you have to pay for that. Um, no access to wholesale or retail distribution. And in fact, there is no way to pay for this. Um, uh, and, and self-published books are still ineligible uh, for many established literary prizes because many of these literary prizes in their mandate, they were created to support the publishing industry 
And the thing about self-publishing is it, it is in fact opting out of the, of the, of the publishing industry. So remember, the key word in self-publishing is self. You have to do it yourself. You have to pay for it yourself. And, uh, and those costs can add up. I can tell you that working at a small independent literary press, uh, the cost of publishing a book and from sort of snout to tail, we're talking about paying the author in advance covering editorial costs, covering overhead, covering um, printing, shipping, warehousing, distri distribution costs, um, and then dealing with returns. Minimum, the profit and loss sheet on that minimum starts with $20,000. Um, so, so to do it the same way that a traditional trade publisher would do it, should cost somebody out of pocket about $20,000 and you still don't have distribution to the retail market. It's tough. And it might seem like I'm against self-publishing and I'm not. I love self-publishing, but I think, I think self-publishing does things well. And I think self-publishing does other things not so well. So uh, moving on. Self-publishing is not an alternative to trade publishing. They are different activities um, in the same way that water skiing is not an alternative to sailing. Um, they're just different. They're both on the water, but they, they do very different things. There's a, there's a perception that sort of self-publishing has emerged as this uh, uh, alternative to or competitor with trade publishing. But in fact, the opposite is true. Trade publishing as uh, an industry evolved uh, to make publishing more streamlined, more simple, uh, and to take the uh, all the onerous jobs uh, away from the author uh, so that the author could focus on writing and somebody else can handle all the other things. So uh, like trade publishing uh, or the book trade is an interconnected uh, network of different businesses and activities. Um, and self-publishing was always there to anyone who could afford it. Um, and when we talk about barriers to entry, uh, the barrier to entry for self-publishing until very recently was cost, class, uh, economic status. Self -pub publishing was always available to anyone who could, who could pay for it. Uh, and it's trade publishing that, uh, made it possible for people who who didn't have money to pay for publishing to get their books published and in fact and to be paid for it and create the uh the job of professional writer or professional author so and self-publishing does not remove the barriers then there are there are barriers to both there are barriers to trade publishing too there's gatekeeping there's there's limits on budget. You can't publish every book that comes your way. Somebody has to make a decision. There are barriers, but they have different barriers. So I'm just going to get to that in a second. So the, the, some of the different barriers here, um, depending on the kind of self-publishing that you want to do, it's obviously cost is still a factor. If you want a nicely printed book on sort of nice, creamy, textured paper with a straight spine and quality offset printing, maybe you want a spot color, uh, you got you to gotta pay for that. That costs a lot of money. Um, and if you want it to look good, you have to pay a designer to do that for you. Uh, if you want it to read well, the, you have to pay an editor. All these costs add up, like I said, it can be $20,000 or more and uh, to do it professionally. Um, and then you still don't have access to di distribution networks to get books into stores. And the only way to get books into stores then is on consignment. And you have to sort of drive around with a box of books in your trunk and go into each store one at a time and try and convince the manager to take a couple copies. And, uh, and that can take, that takes forever. So uh, the barriers to self-publishing are either not knowing how to do all these things yourself or not having the money to pay for it. And the barriers to traditional publishing are 
um, an editor has a budget to publish so many books. Um, with my with my imprint, I publish eight books a year, and I get hundreds of submissions. So I have to. I have to. Let, let's say I get two hundred submissions. I have to decide to say no to one hundred and ninety two books so that I can say yes to eight. And that's a difficult job, um, but I don't have unlimited budget to publish. You Say out of those 200 books, even if I wanted to publish 10% of them, if I wanted to publish 20 of those books, I couldn't do it. I still have to say no to 12 books I, I really like and, and think deserve to be published, uh, but I can only publish eight. So, and that, so that creates an inherent barrier to trade publishing, limited resources, limited resources on both sides, um, but distributed in different ways. So do you know who I think the most successful self-publisher of all time is? Uh, if you've taken my class on self-publishing at Sheridan College, you'll know the answer to this. Uh, but if not, you may never guess. Um, I'd, be, I'd, I'd like to hear uh, in the Q&A afterwards, if, if anyone guesses what the next slide is going to be. The I, I believe the most successful self-publisher of all time is, and I'm just checking my notes here, yeah. Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, amazing success uh, as a self-publisher and as a publisher uh, of other things as well. Um, and this was Benjamin Franklin's printing press. Uh, it was a, a complicated, bulky, slow machine. And with this complicated, bulky, slow machine, uh, Benjamin Franklin was one of the people who uh, gave birth to the modern world. Um, and uh, I realize <laughs> this diagram of the machine kind of makes it look like it's giving us the finger. So I'm sorry about that. Um, so this bulky, slow, complicated machine that printed wet ink on paper and all those pages had to be hung up to dry before they could be bound and cut. But with that thing, uh, Benjamin Franklin self-published his own almanac, newspaper, and other materials, grain, gained great influence and wealth, uh, influenced a revolution that helped shape a nation, and contributed to the template for the modern world. And he was also funny which is uh, a nice thing about Benjamin Franklin. Um, if we go back and read old issues of Poor Richard's Almanac, they're full of jokes uh, and, and practical jokes too. He would uh, uh, play jokes on, on his competitors. There was another publisher of an almanac uh, named Leeds. And um, uh, in one of Benjamin Franklin's almanacs, he posted a death notice for Mr. Leeds um, and uh, when Mr. Leeds protested that he was in fact not dead, uh, he was still alive. In the next issue of Poor Richard's Almanac, Benjamin Franklin uh, published a, uh, a bit about how uh, he was being haunted by the ghost of Mr. Leeds, who insisted he was still alive. And this went on for years and years and years. Uh, so Benjamin Franklin, absolutely uh, super successful uh, self-publisher. The world would be very different without him. Um, but imagine if he had one of these instead of that bulky, complicated, slow machine. By comparison, this thing is uh, a miracle of modern science. And I know that many of you are probably frustrated with a machine that looks very much like this right now. Um, but compared to Benjamin Franklin's printing press, this thing is lightning fast and way more reliable. And if he had one of these and one of these, this is a long arm stapler that is long enough to put a staple into the middle of a sheet of eight and a half by 11 paper. <coughs> he could have made these. He could have made these. And these also changed the world, but in a very different way from uh, Benjamin Franklin. And this is where we get into the kind of self-publishing that I get really excited about and that I think does a lot of uh, good for a lot of people. And I wanna talk about this because these are zines. 
And zines is a, uh, a word that is obviously uh, a short, shortened version of magazines. So zines are little magazines. Um, and uh, in fact, they're littler than little magazines. And we'll get to that. But where do zines come from? Uh, punk fanzines like Sniff and Glue emerged in the 1970s to fill a gap in the music journalism of the day. And this is in London, England. If you are part of the punk scene and you are reading the music magazines of the day, and they're all talking about, they're talking about prog rock and disco, and they're talking about arena rock, and you are not interested in Genesis or Yes or uh, Pink Floyd, or you're not interested in Donna Summer and Giorgio Moroder, although I don't know why you, you wouldn't be. And uh, maybe you're not interested in Foreigner and Journey, uh, but you're interested in the Sex Pistols and X-Ray Specs and The Clash. Uh, and the mainstream music press wasn't talking about those bands. So people just started writing their own stuff. And photocopying it and stapling it together and passing them out at shows and and leaving them on the counter at record shops and they they created fanzines to to fill in a gap uh that they found in the mainstream music journalism of the day and to speak to their community and and the effect was great because it made their community stronger this little print publication like sniff and glue and there were hundreds of others uh helped get information out about music that people cared about about places where you could go and and see these bands and hear these these records and and not only that where to buy them where to buy clothes so that you could show up properly attired for one of these things and uh the idea of an alternative press was born uh in a way that spoke to a new generation and uh, and zines started proliferating. They they expanded beyond uh, the the punk scene, and they were adopted as a kind of uh, alternative press for all kinds of grassroots niche kind of things. And for the next three decades, zines are an important publishing medium for art scenes, activist communities fanzines for things beyond punk every kind of music every kind of like tv shows there were star trek zines you name it political zines uh there was a, there's a zine for everything and uh zines become a means by which communities communicate and and build themselves and this is self-publishing this is this is this is these are not commercial products. They might be sold for a few bucks, cover the costs, but um, these aren't the kind of things that you you pick up at you know Barnes and Noble. Uh, this is grassroots from the ground up, speaking to like-minded people and building communities. Uh, growing out of that punk scene. The punk scene emerged in the 70s as a, a counterculture, as a reaction to the establishment. Um, it was a very working class kind of place, a uh, very uh, inclusive kind of scene. It was for everybody. But over time, over the decade or so, decade and a half, um, because the music was uh, very aggressive, uh, very sort of testosterone, kind of music, um, the punk scene evolved or, or segments of it evolved into very sexist kind of toxic male kind of kind of space. And, and women who liked punk music uh, found themselves excluded from these spaces. So the riot girl movement emerged as a way to reclaim some of that space for feminist voices in punk music. And it started with a zine in the early 90s uh, and the zine uh, became incredibly influential and it's even though it stopped publishing a long time ago uh, the influence of the riot girl movement which was sparked by this zine is still felt today and in fact um, 
in recent years has uh, struck terror into the heart of Vladimir Putin because the the Russian band Pussy Riot uh, is certainly influenced by and an outgrowth of the Riot Girl movement and is speaking against sort of you know corruption and tyranny in the Russian government and, and these women are finding themselves uh, sometimes uh, incarcerated for speaking against the state and that kind of thing. Um, and it all started in the, sort of the Pacific Northwest when four women decided that, you know, um, they needed uh, uh, to paraphrase Virginia Woolf, they needed a room of their own uh, to sort of build their own inclusive feminist punk movement. And that became Riot Girl. So zines, self-published materials like this can have an enormous effect, uh, an enormous influence uh, on the world. But again, it's not a commercial product. Product. The 1970s might be the golden age of grassroots self-publishing and do-it-yourself culture. Uh, not only did the 70s see the advent of fanzines, uh, but it also saw the rise of street literature, uh, underground comics, and other grassroots uh, in the uh, mainstream. So writers like Odie Hawkins and Roland Jefferson pioneered black street literature in Los Angeles. Editors at the time uh, didn't see uh, a market for like hard boiled crime fiction from a black point of view, but the market was there. Uh, so they pioneered this genre as self published authors distributing their books in barber shops and other places where their community would gather and publishers would eventually catch up and this street literature movement from Los Angeles uh, arose out of the same uh, black cultural moment that gave us black exploitation cinema street art and the birth of hip hop. And very soon we're going to have some questions, uh, but at the same time that black street literature was. Uh, emerging out of Los Angeles, underground comics were evolving into a serious art form. People like R. Crumb and uh, Art Spiegelman and comics like the fabulous Furry Freak Brothers uh, were an alternative to Marvel and DC and uh, mainstream comics of the day. And this started as a, a self-published industry. And now there's films and Art Spiegelman is received the Pulitzer Prize and uh, everything eventually sort of grows up and becomes mainstream if it's if it's good enough. So what do fanzine street literature and underground comics have in common? Dedicated group of creators making work that appeals to a dedicated niche audience. The creators and the audience constitute a community. They form alternative networks of distributions, head shops, record stores, barber shops, and other places that the community will gather. This shows how self-publishing allows niche, niche interests to build community, and then they allow the community to grow, eventually transcending a niche status and becoming mainstream. The Book of Mormon, self-published book. The Book of Mormon has never been published by a trade publisher. Uh, it was self-published by Joseph Smith, who wrote it, and then it was published by the church that he founded. Today, there are 16 million Mormons in the world, and there are about 200 million copies of this book in print. If you've been to uh, one of the Marriott hotels, you'll have found it in the table next to the bed. And uh, this is certainly an influential self-published book, maybe up there with Benjamin Franklin. But it's all about building a community, and in this case, a religious community. In the case of uh, punk fanzines, it's about building a musical community or a style community. In the case of uh, underground comics, it's about building a community of people who are into weird art and, and are maybe bored with you know, uh, mainstream comics. Uh, here's another self-published work that gave rise to uh, re a religious movement, although in this case a satirical one, the Church of the Subgenius pamphlet number one was self-published in the late 70s in Texas, and today there are members of the Church of the Subgenius all over the world, including David Byrne, R. Crumb, who we just were referring to in the uh, underground comics movement, and uh, 
Paul Rubens, uh, who was famous for his character Pee Wee Herman. So self-publishing is great for building creative communities with a specialized focus. Weirdos and misfits, artistic and political revolutionaries, marginalized demographics, small press collectives and book fairs, DIY communities and zine fairs, stuff like that. Self-publishing is less great at positioning an author or a specific book to break through to commercial success in the mainstream book trade. Again, because access to distribution and those sorts of things aren't there because of cost barriers, out-of-pocket costs, um, those kinds of things. So what's the one question anyone should ask before entering any kind of publishing transaction? Ask yourself this question, who is the customer? Who is the customer? And if the author is the customer, then we can't expect the reader to be the customer. Uh, it's, uh, if the author is the customer, the business model relies on the author paying into the business. Um, and once the author is paid into the business, they got the money they were looking for, and, uh, and they're going to be less incentivized to help that author uh, get that book into the hands of readers. And that's how a lot of self-pub platforms operate currently. Who is the customer is my key question. Does self-publishing align with your goals? Do you want to create an artifact that speaks to a specific audience? Do you want to build and participate in a community of like-minded people? Is your work non-commercial enough that it's suited to this kind of thing, not intended for a mass audience or the book trade? Self-publishing might be for you. Chat books, pamphlets, zines, community building, grassroots publishing, but also going back to the beginning of our talk, uh, the other kinds of niche publishing, like, like uh, community cookbooks, like the history of a given institution, like your family tree, like uh, other kinds of things intended for a small audience, perfect for self-publishing. And now I can turn it over to Pamela to let me know what some of the questions are. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Paul. That was so interesting. I love the history of uh, self-publishing and the idea of community. That's so positive. I love that. Okay. We have a few questions here. And uh, so one, how has self-publishing been affected by paper shortages and the other supply chain issues currently being in, experienced in Canada? Um, great question. And I'm just turning off my screen share now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Self-publishing uh, has been affected by the very same uh, supply chain shortages that are affecting trade publishing because uh, all those books get printed on the same paper, no matter who's paying for it. Um, so it's the printers who are short on paper. And it's not just paper. It's thing, things that are used for binding, things that are used for covers, cover stock. Um, when you buy a, a book, it might have a glossy film on it or I might have a matte film on it but those are she those those come in roll sheets of plastic that get applied to the cover stock so some of the chemicals that make the plastic that make the glossy film that goes on the cover of the book those are in short supply in the in the supply chain so it goes really deep so um, what it means is that uh, printing costs go up what it means is that printing times get longer uh, the wait to get something printed uh, gets a lot longer, um, and uh, and your choice of materials is is limited because maybe they can't get everything they used to be able to get. The other thing that happens, and this is this is especially affects the little guy. So this is going to affect self publishing, and it's going to affect um, small independent. Uh, literary publishers and, and micro niche publishers and things like that is um, if you're operating a printing operation and if if your usual customers are uh, smaller operations, uh, what happens in a supply chain disaster like we're having now is suddenly a, a big boy like HarperCollins or Penguin Random House comes knocking on your door because the the printers that they usually work with 
big ones are also having supply chain issues and maybe can't fulfill the demand for their books. So they come in with a guaranteed order for 10,000 copies of this and 20,000 copies for that. And suddenly the, the orders for 1,000 copies of something and 5,000 copies of something that from, from smaller operations get pushed down the, the, the ladder in terms of, of their priorities. Uh, so I, I know uh, from talking to a lot of people in uh, sort of independent publishing, that uh, wait times for their books have been longer because the printers that they're used to dealing with are, are fulfilling larger orders for bigger companies. And that's one of the things that happens uh, mm -hmm. as the supply chain sort of breaks down. And mm -hmm. if you thought it was bad last week, this week, and our hearts go out to the poor people of the lower mainland of British Columbia, but a lot of that, a lot of those materials, a lot of that paper, a lot of those plastic sheets, and a lot of books get printed in China. And, or they come in on ships from other places around the world to the port of Vancouver. And Vancouver now cut off in terms of roads, rail, all mm -hmm. kinds of things. Um, so if you thought there were supply chain issues last week, this week, they're going to be 10 times worse. Oh. And uh, so if you wanted to get somebody a book for Christmas, order it now. <laughs> or you should have ordered it last month. Yeah. Yeah. Order. yeah. Okay, that's a bit grim, but let's hope for better days ahead on that front. Um, how do micro niche publishers of poetry make a living or at least break even? They don't. They don't. It's a labor of love. Um, I don't know. The last uh, chat book I self-published, um, I made 50 copies of it. And I'm a poet with some reputation. And I think I've still got, and that was two years ago, I still got half of them in a bag just behind me in my office over here. Um, you do it because you love it. And you keep the costs down so that when you're out of pocket, you're not out of pocket thousands of dollars, but you're out of pocket $50, $100 at most. Um, only spend what you want to spend on making a beautiful object. And the more beautiful you make the object, the more people will want it. And um, at, at that level of sort of micro niche poetry, um, if you're operating at sort of the level of like the small press fair where people put chat books out on a table and you build community that way. Um, the more beautiful your chat book is, the more people will want it. It becomes a, like a fetish object. And if you're at the level where you graduate from sort of just publishing other people's chat books and you're, and you're publishing trade books, uh, you might be out of pocket for a couple of years and then you have to start qualifying for uh, subsidy grants from arts councils, from the Canada Council for the Arts, from... Uh, Canadian Heritage has a book fund, uh, the Department of Canadian Heritage. And then the, that's at the national level. At the provincial level, there's the Ontario Arts Council and there's Ontario Creates. And then, and then there's sort of municipal or local uh, levels of support, but very few uh, mainstream, traditional, small, independent, Canadian-owned book publishers could survive without those supports mm. uh the the playing field is so unlevel with monopolies towering multinational monopolies like Bertelsmann which owns Penguin Random House and all kinds of other media outlets and News Corp which is Rupert Murdoch which owns Fox News but also owns Harper Collins um, like a little, a little publishing company like Woolsack and Wynn, where I work, um, we punch above our weight and we publish great books. Absolutely. And sometimes we discover talent that goes on to uh, bigger and brighter things. Uh, but we wouldn't be able to do what we do in the same arena uh, as News Corp and Bertelsmann's. Uh, and Simon and Schuster uh, w without kind of these these subsidies. So um, breaking even is either at that sort of at the small press fair chat book level, 
something you hope for. And uh, at the at the trade publishing level, um, something you apply for. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Do you feel that zines still have a role in society, given that we have an internet now? I love zines, but I'm wondering if, if many are produced these days. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I'm bullish on zines. Um, Canada still has um, Broken Pencil Magazine, which is the only magazine I'm aware of that is a professional magazine whose mandate is to cover DIY culture, and specifically zines. And it's the only magazine I've ever seen where zines get reviewed. And, uh, and of course, there's Canzine, which is a big zine fair that goes on every year. Um, but I, I'm also a big believer in print. And I'm less enthusiastic about the internet as sort of a publishing medium. Um, print sticks around. Um, I've got zines and chapbooks that I've owned for 30 years and they're still here. Um, I've also somewhere, I just found a like a floppy disk that I've had since like 1998. I, I, there's no way I can get any information off that thing. Um, it's not even heavy enough to be a paperweight. It's completely useless. Um, paper lasts a lot longer than bits. And um, another thing about the internet, and uh, I was just thinking about this actually a little earlier today. So this gives me a chance to say this now. Um, I, think it's, I think it's kind of a fallacy that the internet is always this great democratizer, this leveling of the playing field. Um, I, think, I think the internet also makes it difficult to sort of develop and foster talent in sort of sm in small spaces. Um, the th great thing about zines and street culture and like sort of subcultures like like punk over here or an art scene over there is that it's easier to sort of come up in these silos to be a big fish in a small pond so to speak and then you can graduate from that small pond uh once once you become interesting once you you've sort of built up your talent and your and your sort of who you are as an artist in these smaller spaces underground comics or whatever then you can graduate from that but there's um, there's no small ponds anymore. All the small ponds have been covered by the ocean of the internet, where you, instead of competing with like eight other people who are also interesting in your field, you're just competing with the entire universe of distraction. And um, it's much harder to stand out and sort of, we want to talk about things like fostering talent and sort of, and subcultures and sort of like-minded communities uh in some ways more difficult on the internet so in some way some 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 barriers come down others come up um and um but yeah there's there's there's, there's not really small ponds the way that there used to be because they're all under the, the flood of the of the great internet ocean so i still believe in the efficacy of print and of the local and of the communal um, and in meeting in uh, community halls and sharing print objects. And I think that is a much more visceral and felt way of building community than starting a Facebook group or something like that. Mm. Yeah, and I think there's something to be said for that 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 kind of physical copy as well. That uh, you know, people can kind of go away and and uh, and cherish. You know, I think that's something that I know. But Baseline Press is uh, makes does beautiful poetry chapbooks, and they're 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 really you know quite beautiful beautiful art forms. People still like to read print. Yeah, and um, I know that eBooks are handy, but they're not as sensual as, as a printed uh, book or even mm -hmm. a, a zine. Um, and there's, there's a reason why vinyl is popular again, um, because it's tactile, because it's visual, because it involves the senses, it's design uh, as well as sound. Um, and you can look at an album sleeve or you can look at the thumbnail for your MP3, which is more 
which is more desirable. Um, there's the handiness of the internet, but it, 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 it comes at a cost. And the cost is uh, the tactile, sensual experience of engaging with your art. And, uh, and that's why I think things like zines, print books, vinyl records um, will always be desirable. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, we are out of time. Uh, we have had a request for notes from your session. Um, if you're willing to share some of those notes. Um, also, somebody wants to know what were the four books of yours that you liked? She said they only, they only caught two. So at the very least, we can send oh, out. Uh, uh, well, that was a joke. I only had room on that slide for four <laughs> of my seven books. So it was, it was, it's the most. if you want to know what they are and you want to go on a bit of a scavenger hunt, they're the most recent four books so okay that's great well thank you paul this has been a really interesting session i i learned a lot about self-publishing i do the history is fascinating and i love the fact that trade publishing kind of came out of uh, self-publishing and and the whole idea of, of community as being part of uh, the benefits of, of self-publishing so thank you for this really interesting talk great to have you thank back you here much. and thanks for having me back again yeah it's always a pleasure um, thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, we are near the end of our festival. Uh, we have some events this weekend. Um, beginning on Saturday, we're going to have at one o'clock uh, Beyond Ear Candy, making podcasts that matter. And that's with Claire Taysen, Taysen uh, Wah Bryce and Chioke Alanson. And that's going to be an interesting um, uh, session, I think. Claire Taysen is, is behind our our. Uh, podcast series that we run out of uh, New Quarterly, which has one by uh, Paul. Is if you have a chance to look at our Parallel Careers podcast, I think it's a, it's really a fascinating. Podcasts are something I didn't talk about, uh, but I think that's an area of self-publishing in the digital space that's actually taking off um, because the uh, the medium really lends itself to engagement, um, and it's 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 much more pleasant to listen to someone talk. Uh, through a computer than it is to um, uh, read a whole book. Mm. Well, we'll have to uh, invite everyone to tune in on Saturday to hear more about podcasts. In the meantime, thank you again, Paul, and thank you all for, for joining us tonight. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thanks for coming, everybody. Good night.